Welcome back legends. I hope you're all fantastic. It's time for another installment of Friday Q&A. To everybody who submitted a question for this week's Q&A, I thank you all. And to everybody who would like to submit a question for next week's Q&A video, simply put them in the comments section below. Before we get started, I'm just gonna toot my own horn and say there's a brand new Ragdoll live album out now. I've put a link to that one in the video description if you wanna go and check it out. If you wanna support the channel directly, there's also a link to my Patreon as well as a link to the Discord server if you wanna come and have a chat. I'll also just say a very happy birthday to all around legend and friend of the channel, Mr. Troy Nababan. Everybody get in the comments and send Troy some love. It was his birthday yesterday and Troy, I hope you had a fantastic day. Anyway, let's get straight into this week's questions. Pre-EQ versus post-EQ. What's the difference? I'm gonna demonstrate this for you all by playing a heavily distorted amp sound. I'm gonna place a high pass filter before the amp. The high pass is set at 300 Hertz. You're gonna hear it off, then you're gonna hear the filter before the amp, and then you're gonna hear the same filter after the cab. So it's nothing pre-EQ, post-EQ. Let's hear it and then talk about it for a second. <laughs> Now there is a big difference between placing that before distortion and after distortion as you heard there. And the way I think about it is kind of the way I would think about say trimming up a steak. Imagine you get a beautiful cut of meat and it's got some lovely fat on there. It's got some lovely meat on there. And you think about how you want to cook it. And you think to yourself, what do I want to do with this? Do I want to chuck this on the barbecue and cook it really, really quickly? Or do I want to let it kind of marinate in its own juices and its own fats and slow cook it for eight hours? Depending on each of those choices, you're going to trim that steak up in different ways. And I always think of pre-EQ as like, trimming up the steak so that there's absolutely no fat on it. Then you just go in and like you sear it really quickly with an immense amount of distortion. And what you get out of that is mm, a delicious steak or you get really tight, refined, clear distortion. Alternatively, you can cook your steak with all the fat on there. You can slow cook it. You can get all those juices and fats in there. You can let the magic of chemistry do its thing. And then after the fact, you can carve it up. Now, you're gonna get very different outcomes on your steak and you're gonna get very different outcomes on your guitar sound if you do that. And I kind of think of them in similar ways. The post EQ thing is like having a cooked piece of meat and then just simply chopping it up into different bands. Whereas the pre EQ thing is kind of like seasoning or it's like trimming the fat or you're really shaping the texture and the feel of something before you process it. Something like that anyway. I don't know if this food analogy holds up, but I'm certainly very hungry right now after thinking about that. If I could only have one guitar with one string on it and I was stuck on a desert island for the rest of my life, which string would I choose? I like this variation on this question. And I mean, if I had a low E string, I could just sit there and just chunk away on the low E and, you know, hopefully I've got an amplifier there that I can turn up as loud as I like on a desert island. I don't know how I'm gonna generate power. Maybe, maybe I'll kind of have wind turbines or solar or there'll just happen to be a giant dam on there where I can use hydroelectric power. But uh, then I can crank up my axe effects and just kind of play uh, down tune riffs on the low E. Alternatively, you know, if I had a B string, I could play Thunderstruck for the rest of my life. That might be quite a short lived life though, uh, getting stuck playing that for the rest of all eternity. Or I could go for like a middle of the road option where I could kind of tune the string up or tune it down. It's honestly a situation I hope I never have to find myself in, but I think I would probably go for like the low 52 gauge just because I don't know. 
Maybe it would last a little bit longer and it would be harder to break. And if I was all alone on a desert island and I broke the only guitar string there, I think I would be a little bit sad. <laughs> Similar to last week's questions about what's my favorite mode, there's a question that I found comes up a lot when I'm teaching guitar privately. Like, do I know the name of all the notes on the guitar? And it is quite an ambiguous question. Uh, I would say that if there was a timer and I was in standard tuning and someone pointed to a fret and said, what note is this? I could probably get the answer within about five seconds. So I guess at that level, I've probably done enough playing and enough practice and study where I can do that. But I honestly never play guitar and think, oh yeah, I'm playing A right now. I always think in terms of relative pitch, like, you know, we're playing a ragdoll song and it's in drop C and it's in C minor. I know that and I know that immediately I'm gonna get this matrix of notes on the guitar that are like scale tones in C minor and then a bunch of notes which are kind of the funky sounding ones which I might target, but it is way more of a relative pitch scenario rather than worrying about like, ah, oh, look at this, I'm playing an E natural. I'm just gonna kind of go, oh yeah, that's the note that's two tones higher than the root note. And I generally like to map out where the root note and the fifth is because I'm playing rock music and, you know, playing power chords all the time. But uh, yeah, I can kind of map that relative pitch into frets on the guitar. So that's the way I think about it. I think if you use that approach, then knowing the name of the note is cool because you can communicate it to another instrumentalist if you have to. But it's like past that threshold where it's actually going to make you play better or do anything interesting. It's more just an analytical tool. It's like, you know, the thing is what I'm interested in. And then the note name is just the label that we put on the thing so we can communicate it with other people. So focus on the thing. I'm thinking about stakes again. <laughs> Have I tried one of those K-Line Leon drive pedals yet? You know, I haven't and I think I missed the window because before I did this video, I had a look online and I feel like they were about 40 Australian dollars maybe a year ago and I can't find them for less than 70 Australian dollars on eBay or Amazon and yeah, I don't think I wanna pay that much money just to have my name on something. I'll just take like a Boss SD1 and a Sharpie and write Leon on it and then that can be the Leon drive. But I did hear that it's an OCD and the OCD is one of my favorite drive pedals. So yeah, I don't know, would anyone actually wanna watch me demo a drive pedal called the Leon drive? I just feel like it would divert into me making as many bad jokes and as many puns about myself as I can while I'm doing it. But you know, maybe that's part of the point. It's entertainment. So uh, yeah, I don't know what the threshold is for the number of people telling me this is a good or a bad idea before I do or don't do it. But uh, let me know maybe if you've got one, if you've got a Leon drive, do you actually enjoy it? Is it something you would recommend to other people and is it worth the money? <laughs> The band Saga from Canada. We're getting deep into the prog rock netherworld right now. What do I think of Saga and what do I think about their guitar player Ian Crichton? I will be totally honest. I reckon I've sat down and listened to Saga about four times in my life. And one of them was earlier today because I wanted to remind myself which particular prog band Saga was. And I think Ian Crichton's fantastic. And I like the way he uses a lot of that kind of Aldemiola, like Mutola style stuff in his playing. Phenomenal player, especially when you consider that, you know, their first stuff came out in the late 70s, early 80s. It's, it reminds me of like Yes, in the way that the guys from Yes could kind of hang in a fusion context, like a proper fusion context. If you listen to Steve Howe's playing, especially like Bill Bruford's playing and Rick Wakeman, you know, they could all live in that jazzy world. They could also kind of veer into the classical world as well. But yeah, they just have a really unique sound. They're definitely in that category of bands. Like, you know, I think yeah, if you took Yes, what a band like Saga is to the genre of prog that Yes kind of dominate, uh, I think, you'd think of a band like Marillion to Pink Floyd. Like if you like Pink Floyd, you're probably really gonna like Marillion, but Marillion have not sold 
anywhere near as many records as Pink Floyd have, and I think it's a similar situation with Saga and Yes. Uh, although they do have a very distinctly Canadian sound, and I think you all know what I'm talking about there, where it's it's like hard to put your finger on. You know, they don't sort of just stay in their little pigeonhole too much, but I guess that's my listening recommendation for this week. Go and check out the Canadian prog band Saga. <laughs> What's my favorite post Chris Oliva era sabotage album? Oof, this is a tough one to pick. I actually really like Handful of Rain with Alex Skolnick on there, but I think that album kind of suffers a little bit from the production value on it. And my understanding was that they didn't have, you know, a massive budget to go in and do that record. But that album has this edge to it. And there is this undercurrent and this emotional thing about it that is very sabotage but then you know they kind of really hit their stride with the concept albums that came after that and out of all of them i've probably listened to dead winter dead the most and being someone who you know my dad was born in yugoslavia and when the yugoslav wars were happening that was something that was in the background of my childhood and reading about the way they were able to incorporate some of the very real and very tragic stories there into that album and do it so well uh, that album's definitely got a kind of special little place in my heart and it would have been amazing to hear chris play on that album <laughs> This question comes from Hussein, who is a new subscriber to the channel and shout out to Hussein. I've looked at a couple of your videos playing the guitar. Very, very cool stuff. Uh, subs versus views. What is gonna make you money on your YouTube channel? It's a little bit of both. In order to monetize your channel nowadays, I think you need to have a thousand subscribers. But then once you do monetize your channel, it's just based on the number of people who watch the ads on your videos. And if you are looking to build a YouTube channel, Hussein, I would recommend also setting up something like a Patreon account so that before you hit that 1000 subscriber mark, you can direct people to your content and you can start to build up a community and a way to monetize your content before you have to start relying on ad revenue. And ad revenue is, uh, it's always an up and down thing. Sometimes I will notice that it's significantly higher some months and some months it is a little bit lower, but it does have to do with the number of views that you get on your channel. Joy-Cons or the Pro Controller on the Switch and docked or handheld? Interesting little question. I have probably played handheld the most because I think I got the Switch thinking this would be a really cool thing to travel with and I was able to travel with it quite a lot. And, you know, pre-pandemic, I did a lot of flying with the Switch and it was awesome to just kind of, you know, crush through shrines on Zelda Breath of the Wild on the plane. And, you know, going from Perth to Melbourne or Perth to Sydney is always at least four or five hours. So once you kind of settled into your seat, you could just get the Switch out and you could crank through it. And I took my Switch on the last flight I did. We played a uh, kind of mineral resources camp back in August and I took the Switch and it was so awesome playing it handheld, but it is significantly more awesome docking it and playing on a big screen. And when I do that, I generally find I like the Pro Controller for that. So if anybody out there is a Switch user, what's your preference? How do you like to play and what do you like to play? The question of a tube power amp or a solid state power amp or a full range flat response speaker to use with your modeler, I think is a question that will never have a definitive answer. But what I would say to that particular question about what's better is what are you experienced with and what are you looking to get out of your system? If you're somebody who is used to using tube amps, then a tube power amp into a real guitar amp is gonna feel pretty satisfying. It's a great way to get that thump and feel out of your modeler, but get the versatility of having effects and lots of amp models to play around with. That's what I did when I first got my Axe FX Ultra. I ran it into my Marshall DSL power amp, but then I got a Matrix GT800 power amp so I could use the power amp modeling in the Axe. 
And then from there, I started doing gigs where I was going DI and I've done plenty of gigs using an Atomic CLR FR FR wedge. And it's a little bit of a progression. I think you have to ease yourself into this particular way of playing. And now I just plug straight to the PA and I play with in-ears and that took a few gigs to get used to, but it's always a trade-off between convenience and getting the thing that you're most comfortable with. And I'm pretty comfortable with using in-ears now, but it was a little bit of a progression going from a true power amp all the way through. So you may find yourself going down the same rabbit hole. <laughs> Do I do my own setups on my guitars? Yes, I think it's a necessity for any player to at least be able to do the basics, like adjust action, adjust the truss rod on your guitar, and just kind of know what to look out for on particular instruments. It was something that was very, very handy when I started touring because I could just kind of carry around a very basic toolkit. And if anything went wrong with any of my guitars, I could you know, get them close enough to fully functional. A really good example would be doing like Mindsight shows here in Western Australia, where I live in Perth, totally different climate to the north of the state where it's basically a tropical climate, really humid, really hot. Anytime we go and do one of those sites, I have to take a tool to adjust the truss rod and I'll always find it needs a little tweak to get the guitar playable in a totally different climate. And same thing, you know, touring through the United States, you might go play a place like Denver in Colorado at a high altitude. And then the next night you're playing Albuquerque in New Mexico, totally different conditions. And, you know, guitars still think they're trees and they like to move around. So definitely knowing just how to kind of do a basic, like, you know, quick truss rod adjustment, adjusting the action, even just as simple as knowing how to change your own strings. I know some people who still don't do that. And that to me is, uh, that's first world problems right there. So there's plenty of videos out there on the wonderful World Wide Web to learn these very basic skills. And I would consider it as essential as just, you know, knowing how to palm mute or knowing how to set up a basic guitar tone out of a certain set of amps when it comes to just kind of the guitarist traveling toolkit. <laughs> Thanks again for tuning in for this week's Q&A. Again, if you wanna check out the new Ragdoll Live album, it's linked in the video description. And if you wanna ask a question for next week's video, put it in the comment section below. I hope you all have a fantastic weekend. Take it easy and I'll see you next time.